Northern Journey is a one-guy game by Slid Studio with a stellar soundtrack and incredible atmosphere about taking a relatively peaceful hike through the Norwegian wilderness, in which you are humiliated by insectoids, arachnoids, and all manner of wild beasts and ghouls. The nameless main character is enjoying a calm and comfortable boat ride into an inlet when his boat is suddenly sunk by an unidentified bastard. He quickly rows to a nearby pier, he can't swim after all, where he meets a strange flautist who becomes his mission control and sends him on a quest to gather three dangerous artifacts from the grotesque villagers of Deadwell. Their faces are shaped wrong, their movements are stilted and uncanny, their dialogue is stiff and unusual, and they serve as the welcome wagon for the tutorial. Like a good tutorial, it's a microcosm of what the grand vision of the game is. You explore an area to find power-ups, including your first weapon, the sling, and key items, and you use those key items to progress onto the forest path, a creepy, linear gauntlet that requires the player to learn to fight against flying enemies that eventually leads you to Ravenfen. Ravenfen is the first open area in the game. The center is a giant field that the player can pass through if they so desire. In the burial mounds located throughout, the player will find a shield for a puzzle, a lever that unlocks the next area, and what will eventually become the player's primary weapon, the bow. The game has always been pretty insistent on telling the player their objectives, but this is the point when it truly becomes hands-on. Normally this kind of thing bothers me, I don't like being condescended to by game design. Northern Journey makes it work because the flautist legitimately does think you're a bit of an idiot, and they might be right considering the game opens with the player character being lost in a fjord. Other instances are fairly easy to resolve. The protagonist will have his thoughts displayed on screen reminding the player of what needs to be done, like checking your pockets before going out. There are a few objectives to keep in mind at once, which the journal serves as an unintrusive way to keep track of. Certain items will display new quest important text over the screen which can be overwritten with save confirmation text, so habitual savers should check the journal to make sure they didn't miss anything. Greenslit, the area after Ravenfen, is a beautiful, lush, mountainous area covered in rivers and waterfalls. It's the largest area in the game by far, and it's the one the player will spend the most time exploring. Instead of a wide open field, Greenslit is a series of paths and bridges sticking across the entire mountain range. This is where certain enemies start to become less of a threat and more of a nuisance. Your newest weapon is a crossbow that holds 10 bolts before needing to be reloaded, and you find it right before encountering a bunch of bumbling horseflies that allow you plenty of time to aim and fire at them. Weapons so far are technically only minor improvements over the sling because their stats vary and they require a limited resource to fire. Throughout the game you should have been finding orange potions that increase your carrying capacity. Although the player only gets a little bit stronger at a time, throughout the game this ends up culminating into a huge boost. Greenslip features a shortcut back to Deadwell, which is necessary considering the distance you've already traveled and how often you'll need to go back. As the player explores Greenslip, they'll jerry-rig a working headlamp out of two broken ones, allowing them access to Troll Hole. Troll Hole is the first area where the game really wants to ramp up the horror. The game preys on common fears by pitting the player against insects and arachnids in the dark. The player has to fare against dizzying heights and claustrophobic caves before the credits roll. The game never takes control away from the player without a great reason, and the sense of continuity keeps the player immersed. Although on replays it wasn't nearly so scary, this one gave me a decent chill when I played it through for the first time. Troll Hole is another linear gauntlet, but much more vertically inclined than Forest Path. You delve deeper and deeper to the cave, fighting off insects and trying to avoid getting eaten by some thing underwater. It follows you as you descend further into the cave, and if it weren't for the person ahead of you leaving you notes explaining how to deal with it, you'd have a much harder time making it to the other side. Troll Hole also features the first weapon the player might reasonably miss, so I hope you find it. After Troll Hole is a detour back to Deadwell, which includes the funniest moment in the game, and a pair of boss fights. The White Witch under Deadwell is a major difficulty spike, though the footage might not show it. My first playthrough, I got humiliated by her more times than I can remember. She dashes around the arena dealing contact damage, and she can release a worm that chases after you at high speeds. After dealing with the witch and acquiring the key she guards, you make your way below Deadwell and get the last key item necessary to open up the path to Nook Pond. On your way back to Greenslade, you're attacked by a villager who is secretly a witch. A lot of the bosses in this game are bigger tests of patience than skill, but they can still be a lot of fun. The Witch specifically is a fast-flying target who also has powerful ranged attacks, making it a fairly even fight between the two of you. Other boss fights are mostly groups of enemies that try to swarm you that you have to kite around the arena. Though mechanically simple and a bit frustrating, boss fights still trend towards thrilling and fun. As its name implies, Nook Pond features a large body of water in the center. Inside the pond is another giant beast you can't kill, one whose siren song pulls you into the depths of the water. Northern Journey wants you to fear the water. The protagonist can't swim, so every body of water is deadly. In Nook Pond, the player finds a pulley which lets them ride zip lines in order to access new areas. The player rides the zip line leading over Nook Pond, which features an incredible view of the water below. On the other side, there's a new weapon, the bear crossbow, and a bunch of scary spiders that are really good at hiding in the brush. As an intense arachnophobe and enemaphobe, I got annoyed by how many fucking insects are in this game, but that was definitely the point. 
Later on in the game, the flautist will fake you out by telling you you won't see any more living, air-breathing spiders in this world, and then forces you to contend with undead, underwater, and unthrowardly spiders. As annoying as it is, it's a player side problem, and honestly, it's pretty effective exposure therapy. With the bear crossbow and new objective to fix the witch's statue in tow, the player goes back to Deadwell to ask a villager to fix a bathysphere to enter the water under Nook Pond. The inventor, who absolutely hates your guts, is only too eager to comply with your request to trap yourself in a ball and sink to the bottom of a lake. Now that the game has already worked its best to make you nice and scared of the water, you're dunked deep down in the darkness of Nook Pond, where the Nookin is waiting. You traverse the harsh, horrible scenery under Nook Pond with only a light to scare off enemies. All of your weapons are useless to you underwater. It's a sincerely bone-chilling experience. You're trapped in a metal cage as you're being hunted down by a creature you can't kill or outrun, only swat away for a few moments. As you progress deeper and deeper under the water, you're attacked by some poor souls whose fates are uncertain but understood. The Nookin chases you faster and faster, closer and closer. Your sub starts giving way to the extreme pressures it was never designed for, and at the very end you barely manage to get away in time with your objective, a note sheet in a bottle. The finale of the first act of the game is a concert which every villager of Deadwell attends. Everyone rocks the fuck out, and it's a great way to depressurize after exploring under Nook Pond. This is the happy part of Happy Sad from the game's description on Steam. The music in the game is incredible, most of the songs are somber, beautiful, ambient tracks, but every once in a while, like at the concert, the game will pull out a song that goes hard as fuck and the entire cast will rock out to. I won't be going into further detail about the game's story or progression. If you think the game sounds interesting, you should play it for yourself, and if you don't, then you can fuck off. Go find a better game if you think you're hot shit. I dare you. From here, I'll mostly be talking about individual points I couldn't find better spots for in the script, so if you've got dishes in the sink or something, and I know you do, you should go wash some of those instead. Environmental design is genius. Enemies will hide in tall grass, birch trees work as great camouflage for mad sheep, enemies clinging to cave walls will hide behind protrusions. Every area is unique and pretty, or unique and ugly, and they all have distinct palettes that really make them stand out from each other. The only reason to complain about the environment is a lack of a sense of cohesion. You will never get a good look at areas from other areas. Even though Deadwell should be visible from Fall Crush, you can't see the lighthouse in the distance. The areas that connect are separated by both loading screens and off-screen paths, which further alienates them from each other. Details like these might seem unimportant, but go a long way towards making or breaking player immersion. Slit understands that exploration-based gameplay doesn't have to be slow. Movement speed is lightning fast, and climbing hills doesn't slow you down. The height you can fall before dying is generous, so exploring a vertical area isn't a nuisance. The player's aim is offset from the center of the screen because of the way the character holds his weapons. You'll have to fight against gravity to make your shots, and everyone needs to be deliberate because most weapons come with an animation for raising or lowering them in between shots, and the majority only keep one round loaded at a time. Quick movement and slow shooting make for some incredibly tense combat. It's a surprisingly intuitive and fun system, and despite its simplicity, it's obvious Slid put a lot of thought into how it all worked. Northern Journey is a genuine treat of an indie game. A lot of little touches work together to make a thrilling adventure. Slid understood exactly what they wanted out of Northern Journey and obviously worked tirelessly to make it reality. It's hard to find games with half a good a sense of place. Northern Journey is a truly immersive, special experience that you won't find in other games.